Um, there are no definitive works on the subject of David de Ketville. Um, I have found all the information that I'm going to relate to either from newspaper articles or UK government committee reports or Hansard or the occasional references in some of Joan Stevens' books. Um, but we'll see how we get on. This was the headline of the Daily Telegraph last week, <laughs> which I happened to see, and I thought, this is an ideal uh, thing for my talk. Are, polit are politicians abusing their position to better their own needs? I want you to just remember that headline as I progress through my talk, <laughs> and I'll let you draw your own conclusion. Can I just ask, are there any to keep those in the audience <laughs> <laughs> just before I start slating the family <laughs> no good right okay one of the problems that I found in doing this research is that there are no less than four David de Ketvilles and I had a little bit of um, trouble starting off with uh, trying to extract which one was which fortunately my David de Ketville's grandfather, who was called David de Ketville, had died before my David de Ketville was born, so I could discount him. My David de Ketville's uncle was called David de Ketville. He had also died. The only other one was the rector of St. Martin's. Uh, and I thought, well, he can't be doing some of the subjects that I'm going to talk about, so we'll discount him. If I've got it wrong, I apologise. So the David de Ketville I am talking about is not the one who built commercial buildings in the harbour. That's his grandfather. I've put up here a family tree. Now I know it's going to be difficult for people at the back uh, to look at some of the uh, information that's on there. So what I've done is I've kind of um, highlighted various bits. And you can see here that I've highlighted my David de Ketville and his grandfather up there, uh, sorry, his uncle up there, and his grandfather at the top. Uh, David de Ketville was the son of Philip, Philippe de Ketville and Mary Mallet. Uh, Philip de Ketville was connected with the Ketville brothers of Gaspé in Canada. Uh, Ma Marie Mallet was the daughter of the rector of Grooville. Consequently, David de Ketville was baptised twice. Uh, he was born on the 3rd of April 1820 and he was first baptised on the 3rd of August in Grooville. He was then baptised again in St. Helier. Now I would imagine that the reason for that is because Mary Mallet's father was the rector of Grooville. You can't upset the family by having him baptised somewhere else. And Philippe de Ketville was the constable of St. Helier. So I would again imagine that's the reason why he was baptised the second time. Uh, just move over a bit. Uh, so there's his parents there. He had a brother. Um, Philippe de Ketville gets very complicated in those days. Why did they have to all inherit the same names? Now that Philippe de Ketville, I can see him being born. What happened to him after that, I have no idea. There's no death. He doesn't appear in any census. He disappears off the face of the earth, apart from the fact that there is a Philippe de Ketville of <coughs> the right age who is living in Australia. I don't know whether it's him or not. One can only surmise. Uh, David de Ketville married uh, Alicia Rowan. Uh, Alicia Rowan was, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, Alicia Middleton. Alicia Middleton had uh, previously been married uh, to William Middleton. Uh, she was from Tipperary in Ireland. Uh, again, I can see her being married. I can see her husband being killed. Uh, the census then say that David Ketville was the wife, uh, was the husband of Alicia Rowan Cathell. The only thing is, I don't know where she got married. It could well be in that genealogy black hole of, of Ireland. Um, 
I do not know. So she had a, a daughter from her pr uh, previous marriage, Edith Middleton, and, but David and Alicia had a son called Philip D.F. de Kettville. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know, let me just go back before I leap there, um, what the D.F. stood for. Again, I had the problem of trying to find out what happened to Philip de Kettville, the son. Um, I can see him in a couple of censuses. In the 1871 census, he's uh, at a school in Croydon in the UK. But then again, there he disappears. Uh, and I was unsure of what happened to him. And it was only about a month ago that I suddenly stumbled on what happened to him. He actually died in 1873. And this is a copy of his death certificate um, in the Marine Register. And you will see here Philip de Kettle, age 16, <coughs> an apprentice. And the very last column, the cause of death, fell from a loft. It would appear he was a young apprentice sailor. He was on a ship called the Loch Marie. The Loch Marie was part of the Loch Line, which used to sail between uh, the UK and Australia, uh, taking passengers on outward journeys and coming back with wheat. Um, they were involved in a ferocious storm uh, towards the end of 1872, um, where the, the ship was dismasted, or is it demasted? It lost its mast and had to shelter in Gibraltar. There's nothing on the death certificate to say where and exactly when this happened. I can only assume that it happened on this ship in that storm. So things weren't going too well for our David de Kettville. By 1873, he'd lost his son. Now, if we follow through the census, we can see uh, in 1841, <coughs> we can see that he's living... Um, I'm sorry, let me forget about that. In 1841, yes, he's living in David Place. Uh, by 1861, I think by 18... 61, yes. He's married and he's living at Le Bocage in St. Bellard. Now, that wedding there is not David de Ketterville's. I've taken a copy of this from Joan Stevens' book of Old Jersey Houses, which has a picture of the house. So look at the house, not the people. But by 1871, uh, David de Ketterville is not living with his wife. Now, if you um, read Joan Stevens' book on Victorian people, you will see that David Kettville is reported that he used to beat his wife up. And so it's inevitable that they separate. Uh, she goes on to live in St. Mark's Road. David uh, moves to number two commercial buildings. And he's there for the rest of his life uh, until his death where he moves to St. Saviour. So that is the house that he initially lived in. And again, this is from Joan Stevens book. I know it says number 12 on here, uh, but all the houses in commercial buildings uh, were the same. Uh, he lived at number two. The first time that we come across David de Kettle in his uh, political career is in 1845 when he attends a meeting at the town hall regarding a recommendation of the UK government to form a paid police force. He's quite um, vociferous in this meeting um, where he uh, strongly objects to the involvement of the UK government in the affairs of Jersey. This was to be uh, a fundamental issue throughout his career, as we will see. In 1851, he's elected as a, as a jurat. Now, in those days, jurats were elected for life. You did not have to be re-elected. You didn't have to have any 
your experience to become a jurat, even though you sat on the bench as a judge. You can see there that he was elected with 1,173 votes. The next one had 116. The next one had one. <laughs> and the next one had one. <laughs> it's quite interesting that the last comment points out that the last two were both uh, <coughs> residents of St. Lawrence. Obviously, St. Lawrence didn't want to vote. So one could say 1173 against 116, it was a substantial uh, winning margin. <coughs> so he's now a jurat, and he's now going to start to sit on various states committees. Now what I did was I went through all of the um, almanacs for that period and I extracted what committees he was sitting on because it's recorded. And in 1868, he's sitting on the Harvest Committee, of which he is the chairman, the public roads of the island, the pay police, funny that, because he'd objected to the pay police <laughs> a few years earlier, uh, the industrial school, the board of examiners for candidates to the bar, <coughs> again, somewhat strange, because he had no law experience, no exams, nothing. <coughs> By 1871, that's three years later, he is now still on the harbours, the public slaughterhouses, births, marriages and deaths, public roads of the island, the paid police still, the industrial school, the board of examiners, candidates to the bar, we haven't finished yet, the management of the Queen's Farm Lunatic Asylum, <laughs> establishment of the oyster beds, <coughs> Committee on the Periodical Sittings of the States, the Committee on the Session, I can't even say the word, Session of a Part of the Foreshore, a Committee on the Providing for the Dinner for the Quarter Heritage. But by 1878, he's only on one committee, Victoria College. So one can see that he was somewhat active in his political career and because he died in 1879, one can see a bit later the reason why he was only serving on one committee. His major confrontations, the railways. Uh, I'm going to repeat some of the stuff that I said at last year's uh, talk, only a minor part of it, just so you get the context and for those people who weren't here. We're going to talk about the Jersey Telegraph system, uh, political reform, uh, shipyards and the foreshore, and his bankruptcy, which is a lot of minute. So, let's talk about the railways. Um, as mentioned in my talk last year on the Jersey Eastern Railway, David de Ketville has had a long association with the development of the railways in Jersey, albeit on both sides. Initially, he was pro-railway, but in later years, seemed to become totally against their development, possibly because it involved land on which he, of which he owned. The first involvement occurred when a prospectus was issued on the 15th of August 1845 for the Isle of Jersey Railway and Pier Company. David de Ketville was listed as one of the provisional directors along with some other hope high profile names. You have to remember, he was born in 1820, and this is 1845. He is only 25 years of age. Some of the names down here. Uh, George Robert Dawson was the private secretary to Robert Peel, a member of parliament in the Irish government, and he actually married Robert Peel's sister, Mary. William Simmons was a naval officer and naval architect. Robert William Carden was a banker and a conservative politician. Uh, Benjamin Smart Fowler was the agent for John Bradford's Furnival's Manufacture of Salt and Life Boys. <coughs> Charles Bowles Fripp was the managing director of the Bristol and Exeter and South Devon Railway. William Watson, Bristol director of the Bristol and Exeter and South Devon Railway. Uh, but there is one remarkable name on there, Ooh. and that's down here, Robert <coughs> Ness Peel of Bonehill House, Staffordshire. That was the Prime Minister. Mm. Uh, 
William Watson Prohl of uh, Dunster Court, Mincing Lane, he was a, wi a wine merchant. Uh, Sir John Le Coutier, we're now up into the Jersey people, he was the uh, aide de camp for Jersey to William IV and to Queen Victoria. Uh, Major <coughs> James Brigham, uh, obviously brig Brigade Major. Clement Henry, Sir Daniel Chambers McWright. He was the author of the Manual of British Flora. Takes all sorts to form a railway company, doesn't it? And James Rogan, bishop builder and merchant. So he's mixing with some pretty illustrious names there. There's some powerful people. The prospectus talked about improvements to the defence of the island, its communications and the post office revenue that it would generate with a railway stretching from ultimately St. Juan to the northeast, north east of the island. It didn't specifically at that point say where it was going to terminate. They suggested a return of 17% on your investment. And even on your deposit, you would get 4%. How times have changed. <coughs> at the first meeting on the 8th of October 19, 1845, dates were raised by Edward Nicoll and believe, he believed that the costs far exceeded the potential revenue. Also, the army objected to the tunnel underneath Fort Regent. But it did note that St. Catherine was to be the new harbour. And said all that, the whole thing seemed to die a death. It wasn't until 1861 when a paper was lodged for the Jersey Railway. And on the 7th of February 1861, a committee was formed with Dave de Capville as the chairman. In 1862 the bill was redrafted. It stated the line was to be a single line but no gauge for the railway was specified although maximum fares and minimum surface services were stipulated. The bill was then sent to Her Majesty's Council however the bill was returned six years later after concerns about the foreshore, a subject which would crop up again in another of de Bill's doings. Eventually the bill was approved and work started in 1870. The work, however, was hindered by David de Ketville, who claimed that the demolition of the slaughterhouses in St. Helia had not been approved in the original plans, and he consequently raised a clamour de Harrow regarding the demolition. <coughs> but all this did was to delay the inevitable outcome. De Ketville was in the wrong and the railway duly opened on the 25th of October, <coughs> 1870. It's interesting to note that the slaughterhouses came under the control of the Harbours Committee, of which de Ketville was president and chairman of. And they had originally accepted the demolition and rebuilding of the slaughterhouses and their movement to Tunnel Street. However, the residents of Tunnel Street objected strongly to having the sort of houses in their street and so they petitioned, they petitioned the states and a committee was formed I'll give you one guess as to who the chairman was <laughs> and at its first meeting David Keckle said that the meeting had not been convened correctly and he left the island and he didn't return until the slaughterhouses had been built 